Stanford University. Welcome to CS193P Lecture 16. Uh, today we're going to talk about a subject that's dear and near to my heart, which is audio uh, and video playback as well. Which, uh, so we're going to get into some APIs there. Um, oh, we're not going to talk about web content. I guess I didn't update that slide. And, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about settings and um, how, to, how to add application settings into the settings app for your app. Uh, we'll just talk about, ta talk about the announcements. So the announcements for this week, first things first, Paparazzi 4 is due this Friday, 11.59 uh, PM, so make sure it's, it's done. Um, any questions about Paparazzi 4 before we move on? Uh, so as you know, you, you're going to need to, hopefully everybody's read the assignment at least, you're going to need to integrate address book into this. Um, and uh, threading. Threading is going to be a big part of it as well. Um, and we've asked you to build your own feature into there. So come up with something that's appropriate to you. It doesn't have to be very uh, in-depth. It just needs to be something unique. Use something from, from WebKit and show us how you're using it. Um, and uh, point it out in your assignment. So, you WebKit? Sorry, not WebKit, UIKit. Sorry, something from UIKit. Uh, for example, a web view. I think that's where I got my head backwards. You could use video or audio if that makes sense to you. What if you do something like extending the Flickr API and it's not specifically involving UIKit, is that fine? If it's a cool feature for your app, then I would encourage you to go for it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, a next assignment actually is um, that your final project proposals, hopefully you have all received feedback. If you haven't, please let us know. We think we've sent them all out. Um, we, you know, we've, we've got about two, two weeks, two and a half weeks left before those are all due. So um, they need to be ready. And the last thing is this Friday, uh, we're actually going to have uh, the folks from Bump here to talk tomorrow in, what's the, 260? 160, 130. 113, they'll be talking. So uh, they're actually going to discuss a little, bit, a little bit about their business, but also an API, an SDK that they're coming out with. So if you'd like to use uh, Bump in your, in your final project, there's an opportunity there to find out what they're doing. Uh, and if you don't know, Bump is this app where um, if two people have phones and they're running this Bump app, when you bump the two together, it actually hits the cloud and exchanges uh, address book information. So pretty cool. Uh, and I don't know the details of their SDK, but I presume it has something to do with that recognition of two devices. So uh, come check it out. It should be cool. Uh, oh, and before I dive in, um, the, the folks at A-Press, uh, actually Dean Kaplan himself, sent us a bunch of cool uh, swag that I'm going to give out today. Uh, the first is this iPhone application sketchbook, which is essentially you know, a uh, graph paper. <laughs> it's a sketchbook. It's exactly what it advertises. Um, but it also comes with a stencil, which is pretty cool. So if you want to uh, draw some standard widgets, sliders, all that stuff, um, yeah, these two go together. So, if you're, uh, you know, uh, if you're lucky, if you can answer some questions during this, we'll uh, you'll get one of these, the pair. We got about a half dozen to do. So, um, all right, let's get started. So again, we're, today we're going to talk about uh, audio APIs. Yes. Oh yeah, thank you. Sorry. The uh, I'm in Josh's role from last week. So the the TAs we need TAs for next term. Uh, if anybody's interested in being a TA for next term, please email us uh, or go through the standard TA process, which may have already shut down for the term. Okay, so it's too late for the standard TA application process through the school, uh, but if you email us directly, we can um, we can get you through. Only for grad students. Question is, is it only for grad students? And no, it's not. I don't think so. Is it? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but. Uh, Okay, so grad students have preference uh, if they need it for funding, but uh, yeah, I think anybody's open to apply. So, but you need to uh, do well in this class for us to consider you. So, hopefully, you're all studying hard. Uh, okay, today we're going to get into audio APIs. We'll talk about um, how to play back audio, how to record audio, uh, and how to use the media player APIs um, for doing iPod playback. Uh, we'll talk about video playback. And uh, the video editor, so there's a video editor class for doing, um, uh, if you've ever recorded a video on the phone, you can go and trim those. There's actually an API for you to be able to get to that, that UI as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about settings bundles, which is something that, you know, pretty, 
pretty fundamental to applications, and we've saved till right at the end to talk about it. Um, but uh, it may be useful for your, for your final project, so I want to talk about it today. First things first, audio playback. Um, lots of different things you can do with audio, right? You've you all used apps on the phone. You've, you've seen different uses. Um, you could do sound effects for button clicks. You can do uh, alert sounds when somebody does something that they weren't supposed to do. Um, you, can, uh, you can play music. You can stream audio. Uh, you, can, you can also play back audio through the iPod app. Um, you can record audio as well. So you can uh, get, get audio off the mic and then save that to disk. And I'll show you how to do all those things today. There are a few different uh, subsystems for doing this. Um, and we'll, I'll take you through all the different ones. Um, the question is, with, with all these different subsystems, is which one do you want to use? And the answer to that is that it depends how complex the task is that you want to do. So if you're, um, you know, if you're playing back short, short sounds, there's one set of APIs to use. Uh, if you need um, mixing of different streams of audio, that's another set of APIs to use. Um, if you need, um, yeah, the, the, there's, there are, there's about four or five different APIs. If you need like spatial rendering, that's another set of APIs. Um, but, but one thing to note about all this stuff is the device is a phone first. Before anything else, it's a phone first. Right? So the system manages the sound. You can play back if you want, but you're basically recommending to the system how you want to play the sound. If the system decides that it needs to take over the audio, because your user's on a phone call, your sound is going to go dead. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to respond to those kinds of notifications uh, to make sure that you do the right thing. Right? Um, so let's get into that. A um, few different, uh, well, under the hood, there's a very important technology at play here, which is called Core Audio. Uh, now, Core Audio is it's the same audio processing that happens on the desktop. Uh, so as many of you may know, um, if you go to any our most major recording studios use Mac to do their processing. Uh, a lot of the high-end, most of the high-end audio processing and uh, applications for the, for the Mac uh, are actually based on core audio. Uh, and it's a, a very flexible, uh, very powerful set of APIs. Uh, now, on top of core audio, there are a few different levels of abstraction. abstraction. Um, for very easy-to-use sound processing, you have the system sound APIs. For um, a little, little more um, Objective-C friendly, there's a simple a API called the AV Audio Player, and that's great for playing sound, playing songs, for example. Um, and now lower level, there are three that we're going to get into. One is the Audio Q APIs, which come from the Audio Toolbox. Uh, and I Audio Toolbox has some other tools in there for doing file parsing and stuff like that. Um, there's audio units themselves. So audio units are the are these node-based processing engines, kind of the uh, the core of core audio. Uh, and then there's a Open AL, which is uh, an open standard, just like Open GL, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, open GL used for rendering video in a standard way across devices. Uh, there's Open AL for doing spatial rendering of audio. So now to decide which of these you you want to use, you have to know a little bit about each one and what the uh, properties are of each. So we'll start with the uh, system sound API. Okay? If you want to play some short sounds, we're, we're really we're talking about user interface sounds here, uh, less than five seconds each, uh, the system sound API is what you want to use. Now, it doesn't provide things like looping. Okay? So you can't have a, a loop as a background in a game and have that be a system sound API. There's no volume control. The volume is completely dictated by the system volume that the user has set when they go up and down on the toggle switch for the volume. Uh, it plays back immediately. There's no scheduling of these sounds. Um, so if you say, you know, play this chirp sound, it's going to play right away. In fact, if you say play this chirp sound and it's in the middle of playing another chirp sound, it's going to interrupt the, the existing chirp sound, the one that's playing right now, and it's going to play it again. So um, it's very, um, you know, immediate sounds is what we're going for. Uh, and there are only a couple of, of formats that it supports. It doesn't do any you know, highly compressed formats. We're talking about AIFF uh, and WAVE and CI CAF. Uh, so these are uncompressed PCM formats. And PCM just means uh, essentially uncompressed. Right? Um, 
Okay, so how do you play with the system sound APIs? Well, the first thing you do is you have to register your sound and get a sound ID back. Um, then you can take that ID and you can play the sound. And you can, if you want, get a callback for that sound ID when it's done playing. Um, so you, here's how you do it. Let's say you have a URL. You know where your sound is as part of your bundle. Um, you, uh, you call this audio services, create system sound ID, and you pass in the URL. And it will return to you. I believe it's an int32, but it's the system sound ID type um, that you'll get back. Uh, then when you want to play it, you pass that ID down to audio services, play system sound, and you're done. Uh, when you're done with that sound, so you may want to keep that sound around for a little while. Um, let's say you have this uh, alert that you play often. Um, you may just want one of these. You, you can keep it around for the duration of your, of your app. But when you want to dispose of it, when you want to move on, to, you can have several of these existing at the same time, but when you want to clean up, because we're all good citizens, uh, you're going to call audio services dispose system sound ID. Um, and also memory warnings, which you've heard us preach quite often. Um, because these are pieces of data that you can get back at any time, the URLs tend to be from your bundles, then we would encourage that you dispose the sound as soon as you get a memory warning, and then just recreate it when you need it again. Uh, this is also how you do vibration. So on the phone, there's a vibrator. Um, the, when you, you know, if you toggle the ringer switch, you'll feel it. Uh, if you get it, if you mute your audio and you get a phone call, you'll feel it. Um, you can actually trigger this programmatically as well. Uh, the vibrator has a um, system sound ID of its own. And you pass that in, it's system wide. Uh, you pass that into audio services, play system sound, um, and it'll vibrate the phone for some fixed amount of time. Half a second, I think. Um, maybe more, maybe 0.75 or something like that. But, um, if you want to do, you know, if you're making a game and you want, your, you want the phone to vibrate because they just ran into an enemy or something like that, um, then this is how to get that, that physical feedback to the user. Um, now, not all sounds are um, AIFF and WAVE, and there are tons of audio tools on the market. You know, there's actually some, there's a, a command line one that comes with the Mac that would help you convert any sounds you want to AFF and WAVE. Um, and it's AF convert, uh, supports a bunch of input and output files, uh, formats. If you do a, a user bin AF convert dash H, it should tell you all the arguments that you can use. Um, or the man page will work as well. But it'll help you convert any of your sounds to system sounds so you can include into your app. So here's an example, AF convert uh, dash F means um, that it wants AIFF. Dash D means it wants an int 16. The BEI 16 is an int 16 format. Um, input MP3, so it takes an MP3 in this case and generates the AIFF on the way out. OK, so that's the system sound API. Pretty simple, um, not too powerful, but not intended to be. Uh, when we go a step further down the path of complexity, we look at the AV audio player. Um, an AV audio player, it, it will take longer sounds. It basically takes a URL and it'll play that. And you can have several of them running at the same time. Um, it, can be, uh, it can be files that are stored on disk or in memory. Uh, it'll actually, if you have something that's on disk, it'll actually stream that off the disk for you in an efficient, manager, in an efficient manner as it needs it. Um, you can do transport controls on it, so play, seek, pause. Um, you can get metering information. So um, if you want to throw up audio level meters, right, you're playing some, you're generating some sound, sorry, you're playing some sound and you want to show uh, like the amplitude going up and down, um, you actually get, I think it's callbacks for these metering, for the metering information. Uh, again, you can play several of them together. Um, it's Cocoa APIs, so all stuff you're familiar with by now. Um, and it supports a lot of different formats. So the audio file API is something that is part of the audio toolbox, and I'll talk about audio toolbox in a moment. Um, but the audio file API uh, has built-in support for a, a couple dozen different audio formats. Uh, and anything that that supports is supported by AV Audio Player. Uh, here's an example. So if I, um, I have a path in my bundle that's a, let's say, a piece of music. Um, I call path a resource. I turn that into a URL, stuff we've seen before. But when I want to initialize the player, 
I say init with contents of URL. I allocate an init, init with contents of URL, and I have an AV audio player. Um, now I can start playback. I can pause playback. Um, I can change the, uh, the current time of playback. Um, and we'll see a demo of this in a moment. Uh, and again, you can, get, you can actually set yourself as the delegate for the audio player. So the, the delegate methods that will come back are it'll tell you when playback is done. It'll tell you when playback uh, stopped. It'll tell you when there are decode, decode errors. So if, if there's like a poorly encoded MP3 that for some reason it just can't parse, um, it'll tell you about that as well. Um, and it'll also give you these, these uh, delegate callbacks for interruptions. So if you, uh, if you get a phone call, remember I said the system is who really owns the audio here. Um, if, if it interrupts your audio, it will tell you. So if somebody, you get a phone call in the middle of the song that you're playing, it'll tell you. Uh, and you can choose at that time to pause playback, um, and then it'll tell you when the interruption is done, and then you can resume playback, uh, which might be a little more elegant than just letting it, if you don't respond to them, I think it'll just keep playing. Um, it'll actually be silenced, but it'll keep playing, so your, your time will have moved. Um, and actually, if you think about, you know, if you ever play a podcast or an audio book on the phone, um, and a phone call comes in, you want that thing to stop. Right, because uh, God, if I lose you know, five minutes in an audio book and then I have to seek back and forth to find it's a pain in the butt. So uh, respond to these interruptions. Um, yeah. So audio sessions. We've already had some questions on the forums about this, but um, there are different, there are different uh, ways that your application can deal with audio. Okay? You may want to play audio even though the ringer switch is off. You may want um, the, uh, right, so, sorry, okay. If you, you may want, so if you may want your audio to keep playing when the ringer switch is off, you may want to pause the iPod's playback. If the iPod is playing when they launch your app, you may want to stop that. Uh, you may want it to continue, right? So if you, let's say you're making a, a piano app or you want to play back to something on the iPod, that's a case where you want the iPod music to keep playing and you want to throw your sounds on top. So uh, the way the system solves this is it has a set of audio sessions and their, their categories. Basically there's about six or seven of them and you can say that your app is meant for playback and recording, it's meant for just recording, it's meant for media playback, or it's meant for ambient sound. Right? And ambient sound, I think one of the properties there is if you if, the use, if you're playing audio and you tell the system that you're an ambient sound, um, when the user locks the device, it'll actually stop playback. So um, yeah, a few different ways to do that. Take a look at the enum for audio sessions. Uh, and if you're doing any audio, especially in your final project, uh, take a look at those. Because uh, you'll want to specify one or you'll get the behavior that you don't want. Uh, so we'll do a little demo. Oh, right, default sessions. So, um, right, one other thing to say here about sessions is you can actually customize them any way you want, and there are a few different properties that you can set up, um, but there are uh, a few default sessions that you can go with. Uh, you can tell the system to mute other sounds uh, when you play yours, right? again, so if the iPod is playing, you may want it to mute when you start playing. Um, so you can tell it specifically to respect or not respect the mute switch, um, and then the the ambient exa example I gave is a case where they say, yes, mute the audio when the user locks the device. Um, so yeah, take a look at those. Yeah? What's an example of when you would not want to respect the mute switch? Question is, when, what's an example of when you may not want to respect the mute switch? Well, that's your policy decision, right? So if you have, um, you may have seen some games, they keep playing audio even though the, the ringer switch is off, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I like I like to use the ringer switch to turn it off, but uh, you also have the volume controls, right? So, um, yeah, I guess I don't have a good example for that. I just read something the other day that said the ring policy was official. Hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Josh was saying that there's there is a policy for when you should do that. Um, that check the website and we can find. I can find out more. Um, okay, I should give this away. So. Um, What's the API to use for short sounds? Yeah. Sound system sound API. Hey, somebody's taking notes here. 
Okay, so here I've got an application uh, that has a couple view controllers. The video view controller we'll get into it a little bit. Uh, first thing we're going to look at is the audio view controller. Um, let's pull up the nib. So if I go into audio view dot, dot xib, uh, you'll see there are a few buttons here. There's play short sound, there's play long sound, and then there's skip back and skip forward. Um, so I'm going to hook those both up. The play short sound is going to hook up to system sound APIs, and the play long sound is going to hook up to this one's AV audio player. Who said that? Okay, so uh, that's our nib. Let's go into Xcode and see exactly what's implemented here. Um, so we start off, uh, that's the video view controller. We go to the audio view controller. Um, and here we have a method. Let's look at the header really quick. So we have a, a couple of IB actions here, a few, a few here. We have the play short sound. All of these correspond to the buttons, play long sound, skip forward, skip back. Um, and let's look at the implementation. So in our play short sound, so when I click that play short sound button, uh, it's going to call the, the play short sound action here. Um, it's going to get this twang.caff out of the, um, the main bundle. It will create a system sound ID from it. And then it's going to play that system sound right away. Uh, yeah, that's that. So let's run. Oh, yeah? You can give me the brief and I'll fill up people in. <laughs> uh, so we have, the, we have the policy for when you should and should not play audio during the ringer switch. So we're going to find that out for you. Okay, so here I'm going to play the short sound. All right, and you just hear it once. Okay. Now when I play it several times in a row, you actually hear it interrupts the previous time that it plays uh, and starts it playing back immediately. All right. Um, it's gonna be a cool hip hop sound. Anyway, I can't rap. Um, what's the, what's the, why CAFF? I've never heard of that format. Question is why CAFF? I actually I don't know. I like I'm a I don't know why, but I have a I have a love for AIFF. Um, I don't know why. It's just a preference, I think. No, but what is CAFF? I've never heard of that. Yeah, I don't know what CAFF is or what the difference is between that and AIFF. I know AIFF in a wave, I believe, is a um, is an Indian swap. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is with CAFF. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the short sound. That's the system sound API. Do you want to jump in on the ringer switch? <laughs> All right, here. Josh is going to tell us about why we need to use, uh, why you might want to play audio when your ringer switch is turned off. So as Al said, there's actually quite a large explanation on developer.apple.com, but the, the brief uh, explanation for it is uh, you, you don't want to play sounds that would interrupt the user uh, sort of unintentionally, things like keyboard clicks and stuff that they probably don't want happening when they want the device to be silent. But you do want to play sounds that uh, resulted specifically from user actions that were specifically designed to play sounds, like uh, playing music or uh, setting an alarm on the clock, uh, things that the user actually asked specifically they want a sound to play. So. So, if I, so when I go to bed at night and I have the alarm set, and I have the ringer switch off, it's still going to go off? It will still Okay, because I'm really freaked out about that. There's too many times on my like, regular alarm clock where I've set it off by an hour, or I turn the volume down, and okay, that's yeah, good Yeah, even with the ringer switch on, you still, your alarm still plays. Is it? <laughs> um, okay, so there you go. There you go. Josh gets a sketchbook. Um, all right, so now we're going to look at the play long system sound, right? And we'll see what that does here. Let's look in code. Um, as you can imagine, I, I don't need to show you the nib, right? It's, uh, it's all just wired up. The buttons go to the IB actions. You should be familiar with that. So play long system sound. What we do in here is we're going to, uh, we have a song that's embedded in our app, in our app bundle. Uh, and it's you, me, and love dot mp3. So we get the URL for that. And then we initialize the AV audio player. We get a player back. Um, and we set ourselves as the delegate. Uh, then down below, if we're playing, we're going to tell the player to pause. And if um, we're not playing, we're going to tell it to play. Uh, player is an instance variable for the class. So here we only create it once. So if I uh, keep hitting that button, it's not going to recreate the player, but it will come in here and toggle the, pl the play and pause. Um, now down for delegate methods, so well, we actually can't 
demonstrate this because I'm on a computer, not on a phone. Um, but what we do with the delegate methods is when we get an inter in interruption, we're going to tell the player to pause immediately. So if somebody calls me uh, and I'm listening to a song through this app that I made, um, the audio will pause. Uh, when the phone call ends, we get the end interruption, call back, the delegate method, and we tell it to play again. So, yeah. Can't you simulate it by like pushing that menu option that says like simulate lock? Is that in, is that considered an interruption? When um, you lock your phone? Question is, when you simulate the lock in a simulator, does that is that an interruption? And I don't know. We can let's try that. Let's try that. Um, I, in fact, I wonder. You can simulate phone call. I wonder if that's actually uh, if that does it too. Let's give it a shot. Um, Okay, and then another thing down here, so that's our play long sound. There are two other methods here. There's the skip forward and skip back. <laughs> right, so what we do in the skip forward is we take the current time of the player, we add 30 seconds, and we assign that back to the current time of the player. And in the skip back, we subtract 30 seconds. So I can scrub forward and back. Yeah? Does that truncate at the end of the, uh, at the, ends of the clip? Right, question is, does that, so if you go beyond the four minutes or whatever the song is, does it uh, truncate? And yeah, it does. It knows the length of the audio that it's trying to play, so if you go too far, I believe it actually stops it for you. So if you, um, you know, if you, if the song's four minutes and you go to four minutes and 15 seconds and then you try to go back, it's, it's, it's done, stopped. So let's do that. So we're gonna play the long sound. All right, it's the beginning of the song. A little piano intro. Skip forward 30 seconds. Nice little trombone. I know there's a cool, there's a part here where there's a trombone solo I really like, so uh, I think I skipped forward too far. Oh, something's happening. It's pausing. Anyway, if I toggle this button, as you remember from that method, it's going to toggle between play and pause. Pause. Um, all right, so pretty simple stuff, right? There's 30 seconds forward. I don't know why that's happening. I, yeah, okay. What I want to show you is uh, another way you can interact with this, right? So this is a fixed 30 seconds forward and 30 seconds back. Um, well, we can do a little more fine scrubbing, right? If you, scrubbing is basically uh, being able to manipulate the time. So let's add a slider. Go into our nib. Let's hide that. So let's put a US slider. And this is going to be our scrubber. Uh, now we'll go back to here. We'll say, we'll add a new action, which is IB action scrub. And we're going to take the sender. Right? We're going to know that the sender is a slider conveniently. And it's okay to make that assumption. If you know that you have one view that's calling an IB action, it's okay to know that that's a slider. So UI slider, slider equals, we're going to cast the sender, slider, sender. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to change the current time to be the player duration, yeah, times the slider's value. Right, so I'm going to take whatever the duration of that song is, uh, and I'm going to multiply it from, by a number from 0 to 1, which is the slider value, and we're going to set that as the current time. So here we'll hit Run. I'm going to play it. Oh, why is that not showing up? Right. Audio view. Strange. And well, one thing I needed to do here that I forgot, and I always forget, is to hook up the slider as um, to the, the scrub action. And let's kill it and run again. Okay, so here we have our scrubber. 
It's hooked up to the action. When I hit play, it's gonna play. Right. And I actually move that guy around. And for some reason, it's pausing on us. But when I move it a little further and keep it going, what the hell? Anyway, you can kind of see. I don't know what's going on here, why it's pausing, but um, when I move the slider to a new location and I hit play again, it's at the different place in the song. Oh, come on. It's a problem with the simulator, clearly. It, of course. Yeah, it's a problem with the simulator. That's strange. All right. Well, you can, if you can trust me, um, this is how you implement scrubbing, you, or sh should be able to. And um, yeah, you can get the duration off the player. Yeah. Um, all right, failed demo number one. How many more we got? So let's keep going. Let's talk some more about audio. Um, there are a couple other, yes. Good question. So the um, question is, if you have a scrubber that goes from, let's say, 0 to 1, how do you, um, how do you have that scrubber move along with your song? Um, does anybody want to take a guess on that? There are a, couple ways, a few ways to go. Um, anybody want to take a guess on that? Yeah. Can, can you update the slider value as, it, as the progress is to the duration of the song? Yeah, so your suggestion was, can you update the slider value with the, the progress? I don't think AV Audio Player gives you that as a callback. Um, but some of the other APIs do, um, the, uh, like the audio cue that we're going to look at, it actually does. So you would get a callback that said, uh, I'm now at time 15 seconds, and then you can convert that to a, a spot on the slider. Uh, another way to do it, which is actually in rem the remote app, the way we do it there, um, because we're network driven, we want to keep network traffic down. Um, we actually just start, we st when we know what time we're supposed to be at, we start a timer. And then every you know, half a second or, 30 se or full second, we'll go and advance. We'll tell the slider to move to a different value. So, and then when the, you know, in the remote's case, when iTunes says that it has moved to a different time, we go and we reset the timer, uh, and we set the new value, and we start the timer right back up again. So um, yeah, the AV audio player, again, so it wouldn't give you that callback. Audio Q would. Um, and this is where we start getting into some more sophisticated APIs. So, uh, the Audio Toolbox framework gives you uh, several different classes. The one we're going to look at today is the Audio Q. Um, but it, this will let you do um, something that a lot of people are re really interested in, which is network audio. Um, so what Audio Q does is it actually, it's a way for you to feed buffers of data to the audio playback engine. And you can, so if you're generating audio, you can generate you know, your sine wave or whatever audio you're generating. Um, in consecutive buffers, you feed that to the queue, and then the queue will play that for you seamlessly when you, when you tell it to play. Um, if you, uh, you can get a few callbacks. I think I have a slide on the callbacks. No, I don't. So the, um, you can get some callbacks to know when a queue has, um, when a buffer has been completed. Um, it will, give you, it will let you, give you a chance to reuse that buffer. So instead of having to allocate all these buffers over and over and over, if you have, say, a fixed size buffer that you're working with, uh, you can allocate it once, uh, tell it to play, and when it's done, it'll tell you again, tell you when it's done, and you can use it for whatever you else need. You need it again. So um, yeah, and again, it'll let you do, so the AV audio player would only let you do local URLs, right? It, will, it won't let you specify URL in the cloud, um, but the audio queue stuff will. So um, if you feed it a URL for, say, some streaming website that the, the Q APIs support, um, it'll actually take care of all the HTTP traffic and pull it down for you. So now aud audio units is another way of doing audio processing. Um, this is, again, audio units under the hood is what a lot of studios use or what a lot of professional applications use for audio processing. Um, the parallel to audio units in the real world is studio equipment, right? Uh, music equipment. If you've ever been into a, a studio or if you've ever seen how these things are hooked up, um, it's several different boxes, right? Each one, like you have an effects processor, you have a synthesizer, um, you have um, a reverb. You hook all those together. You can have several of those. Um, hook them into a mixer. 
And then the mixer takes several tracks. It'll mix them in certain ways. The mixer has you know, EQs and levels and all that stuff. Um, and then the audio units have, can have outputs as well. So there, there are these processing nodes that can have N inputs and N outputs. Uh, and they'll process audio in whatever way you tell them to. Um, so, you know, as an example, I can take, um, I could take an audio input unit, uh, which I'm going to feed buffers to, and then I can pass it to a reverb unit. Uh, and that reverb unit can feed into a mixer, and that mixer can take two inputs. And on the other input, it takes, uh, let's say, input from the microphone. And then you're going to um, add an echo unit to that and feed that into the mixer. So you have a, uh, you know, what you just built there with those audio units is uh, an effects audio, you know, um, microphone effects processing engine. Um, if you ever seen like the T-Pain app, um, that's done through audio units. I believe they wrote their own audio unit for doing the, um, the auto-tune. Right? Everybody knows what auto-tune is because you hear it on the radio every day. Um, that's down at the audio unit level. That's how they do that stuff. So. Uh, again, very powerful, and this is what the studios use. So um, this is really useful if you want to do DSP. Uh, the last one I want to talk about here is uh, OpenAL. So again, OpenGL is all about um, rendering 3D, rendering 3D, right? You specify objects, and the objects have points and uh, shapes and textures. Um, OpenAL is very similar in that you specify point sources of audio, you specify a microphone, um, and based on, and you, and you specify an orientation, right? So um, if, a, if a piece of, let's say a, an audio source moves in space, what it will do is it'll re-render the audio to fit the head, right? There's, um, the way we, as humans, the way we recognize spatial sound, the way we can tell that 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 dog barking is from over there and that, that door slamming is from over there, is by um, taking the phasing of the sound and the time difference, it's split second, but the time difference between um, that door slamming hitting both ears. And OpenAL will actually sy uh, synthesize that. So if you take a, you know, you have a virtual door slam and you say that, that the head microphone is here, um, if the user is wearing headphones, it's actually going to sound like it's coming from over there. So uh, I believe there's processing, there's uh, effects processing as well. There's textures, so you can tell it that it's, you know, it can bounce off metal, it can bounce off wood, stuff like that. Um, and I'm by far not an expert on the OpenAL stuff, but if you're interested in that stuff, or if you're building a 3D game and you want to get really sophisticated with audio for your final project, or even just general interest, uh, go take a look here at openal.org, um, and they'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, that was, that was audio playback. I want to talk a little bit about audio recording now. Um, there's two different ways you can do, yes? Can you access um, iPod library? Question is, can you access iPod library? And yeah, I will get into that. Get into that. Um, it, there's limitations on it, but we'll get into that. So the AV audio recorder, right? So you want to input sound. There's two ways to do it. The first way is with AV audio recorder. And this is very much a parallel to the AV audio player. Uh, it's a Coco API, very simple, very simple API, and some delegate callbacks for understanding when um, recording began and stopped, and uh, you got interruptions. Um, it does provide metering, so you can find out. Let's say you're uh, you want to listen for microphone input, you can show amplitude meters to show what the you know when the person is speaking, when they're not, um, and it does sample rate conversion and format conversion as well. So you can specify to the AV audio player that you want to in it with settings, uh, and those settings are different audio formats. Uh, so here's an example of that. So um, you actually create an AV audio recorder with, an, with a URL. And that URL is, of course, it's not the source, because you're recording. It's the destination. And the AV audio player will attend, uh, append the data to that URL. Um, I'm going to pass in nil for settings, but I could have passed in, I believe it's a dictionary, uh, and that dictionary could have properties for uh, sample rate and uh, format, compression, stuff like that. Uh, and you can get an error out in case there was a problem. Uh, for recording, right, you can say, uh, let's say just like in our example app where we, we were toggling the playback and pausing, we can do the same thing here where you can record and you can pause. 
So, and as you record, as the, the queue fills up, it's going to write those things to disk. Uh, here are the delegate methods. Well, here's a, just a list of what you get back from delegate methods. Again, very similar to AV Audio Player. Uh, you'll be told when the recording is done. You'll be told of any audio encode errors, right? Encode errors rather than decode errors. Um, and there's hooks for handling interruptions. Um, the last way of doing audio recording here is with, again, it's actually the audio queue APIs uh, through Audio Toolbox. And um, you can actually tell your audio queue to get set up as an input queue. Um, and what will happen then, instead of feeding the queue buffers, it will feed you buffers of, of audio uh, filled with whatever came in from the microphone. Um, so you create a queue. You define the callback function that you want to call whenever it receives data. Um, you start the queue, and that'll start recording. And then um, it's up to you, actually, with these APIs to do the storing onto disk. So if you want to, you actually don't have to store the disk immediately if you want to process that. Um, if you want to do the T-Pain app, you may want to take these, um, these buffers and feed them back into an audio unit graph that'll do the, um, the auto-tune or whatever. Don't do auto-tune. It's been done. Try, find some other effect and, uh, and do that. Um, yeah. Um, if you want to, actually, the, there's a great example, which is the Speak Here example on Apple's developer site. So go check those. Uh, OK, so this is where I want to talk a little bit about how do you get iPod playback. Yeah? That's a good question. Josh, do you know? Uh, is there a limit to how much space your application can use for storage? And do you know when you're approaching that? Yeah. Not sure. I, I would bet. I don't know the answer. But I think you may be able to find that out through the NS file manager um, to find out how much space is left. I'm not sure, actually. In this case, you basically just give it URL within your application and Right. Find it stored. Right. So the question is, well, where do you store that data? And um, as an application, you have access to a few different places to store. Right. You're, you're mostly locked in. We talked about uh, the sandbox a little while ago. Um, you're, you're mostly locked into a few locations uh, in your application, right? So every application actually gets um, its own user hierarchy. Uh, it gets a documents folder. It gets a cache folder. Uh, it even gets its own temp folder. Uh, and you can write to those areas. Uh, it gets a library folder as well. So um, if you're familiar with those folders and how, they're, how things are stored on the Mac OS, um, it's very, very similar to that. Uh, but it's all within your application. So if you're, let's say you're recording, th that actually also means that you can't record something and have another application use that recording, right? So you're limited that way. But. Any other questions about recording or playback? OK. Um, so the media player APIs, media player framework. Um, this is how you get the iPod to playback um, music. So um, you have access to the entire iPod music library. Um, audiobooks, music, podcasts. I think those are the three types. Um, and you have access to play back those items. Uh, you don't have access to get the data for those items. And if you think you know, part of the, part of the um, restrictions here is that some of that music may be DRM'd. Now, sure, you know, Apple got rid of DRM last middle of last year, uh, but some of that data is not accessible. And of course, they don't want you know, applications going and ripping files. So you have access to the library insofar as you can tell the iPod application to play it for you. And as we talked about with the audio session categories, um, the iPod can play in the background for your app. So um, if you're building that music player app, the piano player app, where you're going to play on top of it, um, you can have the user in your application go and pick a song, and uh, then you can generate your sounds on top of it. Uh, there are a few, a couple different ways to get to this. One is through a very simple, very simple view. Uh, I think it's a view controller, the MP Media Picker controller, which you would pop up as say a modal, a modal dial, a modal view, um, and that will actually automatically be configured to um, have the user's library there for you, and then. 
When the user picks one or more songs, it'll call you back and you can do whatever you want with those. Um, if you want deeper access, let's say you wanted to build your own application that does uh, um, custom filtering of the iPod app. I know there's a, actually a former student of this class built an app that uh, the, basically it was an iPod app, but only for, for albums, only for music that you had entire albums for. So um, kind of interesting. Or I think it was maybe five tracks or more per album. And they didn't show you any tracks that had fewer than five um, tracks for that album, if that makes any sense. Um, the way you would do that is through the query API. So the media player framework gives you ways to query the database. Um, here's the MP media picker controller first. So you can initialize it with, um, here are the different media types you can use, music, podcasts, audiobooks. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is a UI view controller. You can actually get that and um, put it in a, present it modally, right? As we talked about, um, either you can put it in a navigation controller or you can just say uh, modal view controller, present, something like that. Um, you can specify whether you want it to uh, allow the user to pick multiple items. And if, if you say no, then the first thing they pick is going gonna, is gonna to close it and you get a call back. Um, if, they say, if they say yes, then they can choose several items and it may have check, check marks or something next to it. Um, and you can also provide a prompt. So actually, this must, be, must already be embedded in a modal view controller. But um, you can allow it to prompt in the nav, in the nav controller. Uh, and the delegate methods, well, you can know when the user hit cancel, and you can know what they picked if they actually successfully went through. Um, and what it actually returns is an MP media item collection, which we'll see in a moment. In fact, we'll see right now. Um, a media, uh, MP media item collection is a set, it's an array of MP media items, okay? MP media items are tracks, we'll look at that in a second. But MP media collection, MP media item collection is actually also used to represent playlists. So you can ask the library for playlists and that's a bunch of MP media item collections. You can ask it for albums and that's a collection. Um, and here are some properties on it. So you can get a collection and you can get the items off of that and it'll return you an array. You can ask for the count. Uh, you can ask for something called the representative item. And if, if you have, let's say you get a playlist that's a genius playlist, the representative item would be the song that was used to create that genius playlist. Um, if you had any other, any other kinds of collections, uh, I think for an album it might return the first item, for a playlist it might return the first item, uh, but there's some smarts in there to know what is the MP media item that represents this collection. Uh, and uh, MP media item collection, because it's an array of types of, of MP media items, um, may have one or more types. So it'll return this enum to you. Uh, it's actually a bit field mask. Um, an MP media item, well, this is, um, it's a property based, uh, there are only two method calls on it. One is can filter by property. So you can ask it, um, you know, are you able to filter by artist? Um, and then you can also say, um, you can get, I think the other, so there's can filter by property, and then there's value for property. So there are several strings you can use. You can say value for property, MP media item type artist, MP media item type title. Um, there's several lyrics, right? You can get the lyrics off of a song. Um, yes? Is that metadata just gettable, or is, can you also set it? I believe, so the question is, is that gettable or settable? And I think it's just gettable. So you don't give, I don't think there's any write access to the iPod library. I think the user, it's up to the user to write that through iTunes. So, yeah. Um, all right, so here are different classes that are available in the media player framework. Um, there's the me MP media library, which represents your entire library. There's the query, the predicate, and the property predicate, which allows you to, um, you can build predicates and then query for that. So if you want uh, all Lady Gaga songs that are greater than three minutes, uh, you can build that. Um, in fact, maybe you can query the lyrics for, anyway. Um, and then MP Media Item Artwork, you can get the artwork from a media item as well. 
All right, so that's it for audio. Um, I'm going to move on to video now, unless there's any questions before I do. Yeah? For something where you're, uh, you want to be like, playing live, like what's the, and, but you also want to do some audio processing, how fast is the feedback? OK, so the question is for um, if you want to do some audio processing and live playback, um, what, what kind of time, you know, what kind of latency do you get? And um, the audio unit stuff and the audio cue stuff lets you specify your buffer size. And if you think about how these things are processed, so you have to fill a buffer before you can pass it to the queue, right? So, um, and you only have to be one buffer behind at a time. I mean, so as long as you have another buffer there by the time that the first one's done playing, uh, you're fine. So if you take, uh, on the Mac, it's pretty standard for people to use 512 uh, samples in a buffer which at 40, 44, one, I think, 44, one kilohertz is about, is about 11 milliseconds. So if you have, um, yeah, if you use a small buffer size like that, which is a reasonable, a reasonable buffer size, you're looking at 10, 11 milliseconds for latency. Um, so 10, 11 milliseconds is in the range of not noticeable. When you start going up to 20, 25 milliseconds, people can tell. Um, like it just sounds a little bit off, right? If you think about video, right, if you, um, if audio is off by a frame, people can usually tell a little bit. If it's off by two, three frames, now we're talking 90 milliseconds, and it just looks wrong. Um, so video playback. Uh, lots of reasons you might want to play video in your app, right? You may want to um, provide a cutscene for an animation. Uh, there's a, a game called Crash, Crash Race Car or something like that, where when you finish the race, it'll actually it'll pan the OpenGL over to a specific view and then show a, uh, an actual video animation that it created that, that seamlessly transitions to the menu or to the next scene. Um, you can stream content from websites. So let's say you're making, um, making the, I don't know, Olympics app, and uh, you want to stream video that's on your website, you can, um, you can do that. Uh, or you may want to play local movies, right? So yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, a few restrictions on the video, right? The video on an iPhone is not embedded in a view. Every time you play a video, it's full screen. And there's a reason why they did that, right? If you look at the iPhone, right, you're all familiar with it. We're talking two and a half inch screen here. If you had to, you know, if, if the video is embedded in, in some other view, you're t it's so small you can't even see it. Um, so every time you play a video, it's full screen. Um, you have some options for how it's scaled. You can tell it to, to uh, fit the aspect ratio, or you can tell it to fill. Um, and you have some controls that you can optionally show if you wanted to, like volume controls and transport controls. Uh, and there are, these may have expanded since <coughs> that, was the, that was true in, in 2.0. I don't know if 3.0 is any different, but it supports .mov, which are QuickTime format, .m, .mp4, uh, .m4v, and 3GP. Right? So those are your video formats. Um, here are your, here's your controller. So when you want to say play, play a video, this is your interface for it, MP Movie Player Controller. controller. You in initialize it with a URL. You can tell it to play and stop, and you have a few different properties. Um, you can have the background color. So if your video doesn't fill the screen, you can tell it to fill the rest with blue if you wanted to. Um, uh, scaling mode, right? That's the aspect, fit or fill. And the movie control mode, which is, uh, there are only three choices. There's no controls, there's volume only, and there's volume and transport controls. So if you want to allow people to seek, um, you would say, you know, the default. And if you're streaming and you, the user can't seek, then volume only. Um, and there's notifications that you can respond to. Um, you can know when a, a movie's about to start playing, when it's done. Uh, you can know when the user changed the scaling as well. So a quick demo. So let's go back to our app here. All right, and here I have uh, just two buttons this time, play with controls and play without controls. Uh, let's look at the code for that. So I have two IB actions down here. One is the play video with controls. 
which then calls into another function, which we'll look at in a moment, right? which just says yes to show controls. And it loads, um, this is actually a web, a website, right? CS193P Stanford ad, ooh, is that up? Okay, and then uh, play video without controls um, is a local movie that it's gonna play. So we're gonna say yes or no for the controls. Uh, but let's look at this play video with URL. So um, if we haven't already allocated a player, we're going to uh, allocate the player and in it with URL, which is the URL that gets passed in. Uh, we're going to listen for notifications for did finish playing. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and we'll just set a couple properties here. If, if controls is off, then we're going to uh, tell the scaling mode to aspect fill, which is, let's say you've got a uh, you know, uh, cinema-wide movie. Aspect fill will say, fill the entire screen, don't show any of the black bars. Uh, versus aspect fit would say, fit it, fit it in so you can see everything. Uh, and the movie control mode in this case, so if no controls, then it's going to be hidden. Um, and if not, we're going to go with the defaults. And the defaults are uh, the controls are there and the scaling mode is fit, aspect fit. Um, now let's look at the callback. So when the movie's done playing, um, actually all we're going to do here is remove the observer, but of course, good citizens, we're going to call player release. All right, so let's go to the video tab. And let's start with play without controls. Um, what you're going to see here is because it's full screen and most video is landscape, we're actually going to see the simulator rotate. So there it is. All right, let's do it again. And I can click on it. Nothing happens, nothing comes up. Okay, now this one I'm wondering, I may have a problem with because the internet connection, but if I say play with controls, see if it works. It's trying to load it, can't find it. So let's actually, um, let's just use the same URL that we had for the local one. All right. So we're gonna play this again. This one's going to have controls. Uh, let's go to our video tab. Play with controls. And this one here has, when I click, the controls come up and they go away. I can scrub, right? I can pause. I can hit next and previous, though this isn't really gonna do anything for us because it just ends the movie. Uh, if I hit back, it would just scrub to the beginning. Actually, it stops it as well. Um, so that's video playback. It's pretty simple. There's really, um, you know, really actually not that much you can do with it. Um, but there is something else you can do with video, which was new to 3.0, and that's video editing. Um, if you look at the, the iPhone's Photos app, uh, you can toggle, if you're, if you're running a 3GS or later, I believe, you can actually toggle the camera to be a video camera instead of a still camera. Um, and if you do that, once you've, once you've recorded your clip, uh, it'll actually give you this you know, touch API for trimming your clips. Pretty cool. Um, it means you're, you know, you're out water skiing and you're filming your friend and they take a spill and you want to post it on YouTube. Right there as you're filming it, you can trim it back to just the spill and uh, post that online. So um, API for this is pretty simple. So you know, why would you do it? Well, maybe you want to, um, maybe you want to post to YouTube, right? Maybe you want people to be able to uh, record and post. Uh, or maybe you want to make a video editor, and I haven't seen anybody do a good job. I have heard there's a, a video editor that's pretty cool. I haven't played with it yet, um, but they're using this API. And um, so you use the, as Josh mentioned last week, we talked about last week, the image picker controller. Um, so you can throw up the camera, and the camera, like the still camera and the video camera APIs are actually identical. Um, I believe there's a flag on the image picker controller to say whether or not it should be video or not. Um, so you record with the image picker controller, and the formats that it can output are the same as playback. So MP4, M4V, et cetera. Uh, here's your, here are your APIs. So you can ask the video controller if it can edit a video at path. Right? So let's say, um, 
let's say you have some video that's, uh, in, I don't know, maybe there's some formats it can't support. I'm not sure why this would return no. But you can ask the video editor if it's able to edit a video. Then you can instantiate one. And this is really, it's just a subclass of UI view controller. So you can push it on to your stack just like any other video or any other view controller. Um, you feed it the path. You feed it the maximum duration that you want it to be. Um, and then you just hit go. You push it. And um, what will come out the other end will depend on the delegate method. So it'll, the user will have all the trimming API that they have with the cameras app. Um, and once they hit save, it'll call you back to save that to disk. And I, the, the actual function you use to save escapes me, but it's like UI image video save video at path video or something like that, right? Yeah, it was really, really long. I, it escapes my mind, but. Um, all right, and you can find out when it failed, and you can find out when the user canceled as well. Um, right, that's actually it for video. Um, all right, two, there's only those two classes, and of course the um, UI image picker controller for actually doing the recording. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is how do you embed application settings into your app? Um, how are we for time? 10 minutes, okay. Um, so applications, as you, may, as, you, as you well know, there's a settings app on the device. And um, each application can actually register a bundle that becomes its settings in the settings app. Um, the trick with settings is to do it sparingly. Right? So you don't want your users flipping back and forth between your application in order to go toggle some settings. In fact, if you look at the way Apple writes their apps, uh, the settings, you know, unless you're talking about mail where there's a lot of configuration, the settings tend to be pretty minimal. Um, what I encourage you to do is to, if you're thinking about settings for behavior, is to come up with the right behavior and dictate. That's the way it's going to be. But if you're looking at settings for um, configuration, for you know, user configuration, that's kind of more appropriate for what you want to put in settings. Um, Right? Don't put in every switch just because it's available. Maybe you want to do this for debugging. You don't want to do this for shipping apps. Um, so, well, how do you build these? Right? So, um, the, there are two ways to go about putting settings in your app. Right? Number one is to put it in the settings app. Right? These are um, default behavior overrides, and they're things that you don't want your users changing that often. In fact, they probably have some preference of the way it's going to behave They'll want to set it up once and leave it that way. Um, all right. Ex again, examples are um, mail account information. Right. I'm not going to change my mail accounts frequently. And Safari search. Well, do you want Yahoo or do you want Google? Right. You choose once, and it's that way for it's until you decide sometime down the road you want to change your mind. Um, the other way you can do these is you can embed the settings in your application itself. Right. And you see this a lot more with games where you're changing. Uh, let's say audio effects settings, you want to turn on and off um, the volume, you know, you want to turn on and off sound effects, you want to turn on and off um, the background music, you want to set the volume, stuff like that. Those things you would want to put in your application. Um, and actually, a couple of advantages and disadvantages here is that if you put it in the settings app, you're actually, you're not running code when people are changing those settings. Um, it's actually going to set values in NS user defaults for you to fetch. Um, versus if you put it in your application, well, it uses up UI space. That's a disadvantage. But you can actually run code when people hit the different buttons. Uh, so um, if you want to put it in the settings app, you create a settings bundle. And I'll show you how to do this in a moment. Um, for, uh, again, for really infrequent stuff, um, you can put it also in the back of the main view, right? So you can um, uh, you can flip over your view. There's actually a flip transition, right? Stocks and weather does this. That's another place to put settings. Uh, and I think there's even an info button that UI Kit provides to you. So if you want to do that flip, um, you just embed that button and tell it to start that transition. Um, all right. So let's um, let's talk about the settings bundle itself. When you create a uh, settings bundle, it's, it starts with a root.plist. Okay? And that root.plist specifies a hierarchy of uh, settings. 
and the settings are predefined, so you can have um, different types. Right? You can have a slider type, you can have a switch type, you can have a group type, or I believe it's called multi-value, uh, for when you, uh, you know, let's say you have three options you want the user to choose from, and to get there, they step through uh, one level to see the three options when they choose one that steps back. That's a multi-value type. Um, and you do this all by, by modifying your plist, right? You're, by modifying this plist and giving it identifiers for each of these items, um, you have a codeless way of getting settings from your users through the settings app. Um, here are the different types that they have. So there's a title, which is really just a text string. There's a text field. So let's say you wanted, uh, I don't know, you want to change their username or you want to change uh, some prompt that they see every time they launch. Uh, toggle switch, slider, multi-value I described already. Uh, group, group is similar to, um, it's another step in kind of hierarchy thing, uh, but you can have other controls in there. Uh, and child pain, of course, comes from a group. Um, each of the items have keys associated with it. And the keys are how you reference them inside your app and you specify those keys. Um, so really quick, this is actually the last thing I've got for today. Uh, I'm just going to create a settings P list, and I'm going to show you how to modify that to get what you want. Uh, so what we're going to do, if you go into, if you control click or you can go into file, new file, um, there's a template set up for you. So if you go into iPhone OS, resource, you can choose settings bundle. We'll hit OK. And we'll call it settings bundle. Um, there it is, right? The only file we care about in here, if you want to do localization, which we'll talk about, I think, in a couple of classes, you can do that. But we're just going to look at the root.plist. So by default, um, this is what it creates for you. There's a group, right? That group has a text field that allows input. Um, you'll notice there are a few different fields here that you can fill out. You can say whether that's secure. So let's, let's say that's secure. We're going to change the title of this to password. Uh, and we're going to change the key of this to password preference. Um, you know, different keyboard types, which we saw with the text input stuff. Uh, you know, here's an example of a switch. Here's an example of a slider. Um, nothing too crazy here. Um, let's give it a name at least. So title, our slider. Actually, we have a title. We have a title here, so we're going to say enabled. Um, let's call this our switch. Um, what happens is when you create a setting, settings bundle, it gets embedded in your application. And when the user downloads that application from the App Store, um, the first thing that Springboard does, Springboard's the launcher app, is it checks for that settings bundle and it actually puts that in settings for you. Uh, so you don't have to run any code to install it. It just gets installed for you as long as that settings bundle is there. So I'm going to run only so that we can compile and put it in the bundle. All right, so if we go into settings now, that should have gotten registered. And here we are, the AVW samples app. Uh, and I've got this password text field, which should, uh, you can't see my password. Uh, I have a switch and I have a slider, right? Um, each of these I can get the value from in my app. So. Just to show you really quick, I'm going to save this. I'm actually just going to quit. And we're going to modify our application so that we take the password preference. And I'm going to make my password visible. So we go into, let's go into our audio view and just put a text field there. Uh, library. Let's put a label here. And we'll point to it, and then we'll load the preference, and you'll see what happens. So I'm going to put an IB, action, IB outlet, um, UI text, sorry, UI label, password field. Um, and what we'll do is in, in our view did load, we'll get that preference, and we'll just set that as the text. So do I already have a view did load? I don't think so. So view did load. 
we're going to say, what was it, password field dot text equals NS user defaults, um, standard user defaults. And we're going to say string for key. And the key was whatever we specified in the, I think I copied it, pa password preference. So that string. Uh, and let's just run. Actually, I need to hook that up in Interface Builder. Password field. Let's just run. You can't see my password. Um, so yeah, that's it. It's really when you when you set up a settings bundle, it's really access. It's just accessible through NS user bundles. The keys you set up yourself. Um, you can look through the documentation to see what the different types are, uh, if you want to find out more about how to build these things. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Um, I, actually, I still have about a half dozen of these. If anybody wants one, just come up after class. And uh, yeah, thanks. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.